Thank you for coming. Uh, it is somewhat, it, it's a great pleasure to be here again. Uh, I love an audience of people who actually do art, as many of you are. Uh, and it's also somewhat frustrating, um, because I'm very much a historian. I have this, uh, for that reason, but also personal vice of bringing entirely too many slides to every occasion. And yet, what you really want to do with an audience of artists is look at every image for a long time. However, uh, there are only 36 Vermeers in the world. There are some very good books on the subject, which I'm shortly to replace. I think, and uh, or at least, you know, my entry into that area. And um, that is, incidentally, the reason I'm here on Vermeer again. I'm told I spoke about Vermeer three years ago here. I had no idea it was so recently. But um, also, I should say, besides working on Vermeer, of course, there's the Hockney uh, factor of um, attributing all progress in realism in Western art to some kind of mechanical gizmo. And I'm a little suspicious of that. I'm still in favor of human beings having something to do with it. And there's a much more, I don't know if you know Hockney's book called Secret Knowledge, which attributes to lenses through the ages virtually every advance from Jan van Eyck to last week uh, to some kind of instrument. And there was a wonderful cartoon, I think it was in the uh, New Yorker, about uh, holograms and Michelangelo. Uh, and, you know, that really captured the flavor of it. But there's also an English book by a man named Philip Stedman called Vermeer's Camera. And he is a specialist in imaging architecture on computers. So he enters the Vermeer field from a particular angle. And he is convinced that all of these things that we see in Vermeer's work were actually before the artist's eyes, and he basically traced them. And we'll see about that in this lecture as we look at these works of art. And um, I would like to begin firstly, cause should we have the, can you do lights down just a little bit? Uh, one last thing about why Vermeer is that I've always been fascinated, and I would say the reason I'm in the, the Dutch field, or got into it, now I'm, I'm, I read a lot of the history of Dutch society, and I'm, I'm very enamored of the culture itself, but originally what drew me to this field was as a budding art historian doing master's work at Brown University, and back in those days, a book by Ernst Gombrich called Art and Delusion was rather new. And I'm fascinated by the differences, as many of you in this room must be, between perception, between what we see in the environment, and representation on a two-dimensional surface, how you make those transcriptions of reality into some kind of art form. In fact, of course, it's not transcription at all. It's always some kind of metaphor or analogy. If you just think, for example, of Monet's brush strokes capturing the sense of scintillating light, of course, it, has, it, it doesn't resemble real daylight outside whatsoever. And yet, it is an awfully good parallel to that experience if you're using oil paint in the 1860s and 70s. To understand Vermeer, you need to know a little bit about his city first, Delft, which today is regarded by hordes of Japanese tourists and people also from other countries, mostly not from Holland though, as a charming, provincial, rather middle-class, brick-lined place that hasn't changed to, since about 1700. And there's some truth to that, except for the great university that's in Delft. Uh, it is middle class and not as prominent today as, uh, or not as urbane as Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Utrecht, and a few other places. But it was really much more than this in the 17th century. I think the image that we have today of Delft is somewhat conveyed by these two pictures. The one on the left is a family portrait by Peter de Hoek around 1658 with a view of the new church in the background. And the one on the right, of course, is Vermeer's The Little Street or Het Stratje, 
1658 also, which we will return to a little later round, a little later on. And I think when people walked into my exhibition, Vermeer and the Delft School in 2001, it was this image of brick-lined streets and fairly small houses and people sweeping the sidewalk and so on that they were probably looking for. Today, Delft doesn't really upset that notion. Here's two views of Delft, the outer Delft Canal, which means the old dig, which is where the name Delft comes from the dig on the way to Rotterdam and the sea. And here's the main square in Delft with the town hall on the left and the same outer kirk or the old church on the right. So what do you get when you walk into the first room of that exhibition in 2001? You get this, a wall of tapestries, which when you didn't use wide angle lenses but used your eyes, really seemed to cushion you in glorious fabric with gold threads and so on. And one of four horse caparisons that were made in the 1620s for the king of Denmark. One of these tapestries on the wall, they're all by Francois Spearing from Delft, formerly of Brussels, and he set up in Delft around 1600, and he did tapestries for the courts of Europe, including the court of Holland, right in The Hague. And a main theme of my exhibition was that this was a very sophisticated place precisely because it was only three miles from The Hague, the court city. You can walk it in an hour, you can get there in 10 minutes today on the tram or in a taxi. And in 17th century Delft, you could do it in under an hour um, by horse or carriage or in about an hour by a canal barge. And for four generations before Vermeer, there were sophisticated patrons in Delft itself and in the neighboring court city of The Hague, three miles away. And Delft was very much a bedroom community for the court city of The Hague, where you were basically either at court or you were part of the support staff for the court. There was very little middle class, actually, in The Hague in the 17th century, they tended to live in Delft, including the personal physician of the Prince of Orange. If, if you wanted him, it was a two-hour business just to get him. You had to run over to Delft and bring him back. And uh, most people who supported the court did leave in, live in Delft, including the court portraitist Meervelt, who we'll see in just a moment. Here are two more spearing tapestries, closer view of the horse. Two of these survive, these caparisons, which are, of course, uh, impossibly fancy parade dress. There is no other instance in the history of art of tapestry to clothe horses, uh, except for the set of four that was done in the 1620s in Delft. And on the right is a tapestry very similar to the object number one in the recent Baroque tapestry show at the Met. It is, in fact, the pendant to the one which we bought back in 2001 right out of this exhibition. Also, very fancy silver was done in Delft. These objects are also about 1600 to 1610, as you saw uh, the tapestries. A gilled cup covered just a fancy centerpiece for a table and an impossibly fancy salt cellar with a sea monster and Neptune on the top to express the idea of salt, just what you want on your tabletop. Also, very fancy still lifes produced in Delft, the one on the left, Jakob Fosmar in a private collection, 1613. These flower still lifes appealed to people who collected rare plants, and they were mostly courtiers who knew botany from fancy books. These are still lifes of flowers that never bloomed at the same time, and some of them, like the fertility from Turkey on the top, no one in the country had ever seen unless they'd been to Turkey themselves. It's picked up from botany books. So both the subject and the large painting itself, it's about three feet high on a mahogany panel, are very fancy uh, collector's items. The work on the right is by Balthasar van der Ast, uh, collecting shells from the South Seas and fancy flowers and knowing your bugs and spiders and so on. 
very much a well-educated kind of subject matter. Here's another work by van der Ast, A-S-T, on the left from the early 1650s. Rather interesting for Vermeer, the format, the table against a window in a corner. He died in 1657, so it's guaranteed that whatever the date of this picture from the early 50s, it's a bit before Vermeer's Milkmaid, etc. And on the other side, Willem van Alst, in 1650, which is a uh, fruit still life with beautiful fabric. I might just draw your attention to, I don't, we don't have a laser pointer, do we, in the room, but you can see pretty well. Look at, in particular, the highlights on that blue fabric, and you see the fringe in the lower right corner with this kind of stippling effect of little white dots. It's something which Vermeer actually saw in a few other painters. One of them was Willem van Alst from Delft around 1650, and the other was Kalf in Amsterdam and a few other still life painters used a somewhat analogous point delay technique, which of course Vermeer took much further. Here's a couple of maps. Uh, on the left is Holland, or properly called the Netherlands. Holland is the largest province which in the 18th century became the provinces of North Holland and South Holland. Every major city was on the, in the coastal province of Holland with one exception and that was Utrecht in the middle of the country. And The Hague, the port city, is here. Delft is right there and Amsterdam and Harlem are up further. Just 10 miles to the north of Delft is Leiden, the university town. All of this is pretty close together. Vermeer could have gone to Amsterdam and come back the same day, and we would never know. You know, no MasterCard receipts or anything like that. I still remember, thank you, 15 years ago when I left Greece without checking out through customs because I got so tired of it. And technically, I'm still in Greece. So imagine what the evidence is for the 17th century. Did Vermeer know Rembrandt's work? I mean, I, I remember back in the 1970s when art, serious art historians like my, myself would conjecture could he have gone to Amsterdam? Could he have visited Rembrandt's studio? And now you read travel books and so on, and uh, you read about, for example, there's this guy, Willem Snellings, who wrote a travel book in 1662, and he goes from Amsterdam to Harlem, down to Leiden, uh, has supper in The Hague. You have to go through Delft to get down to Rotterdam, which is down on the, well, Rotterdam is here, and then there's a little, there's the Rhine River, which exits right here, and that night he leaves for England. Except for Utrecht, he was in every major city of the Netherlands in one day, so uh, travel was fairly easy. It's not comparable to the different schools of Italy, for example, Florence versus Venice and so on. In Delft also is the most important national monument in the country, the tomb of William the Silent, who to put it simply is the George Washington of the Netherlands, the man who led the revolution against Spain from the 1560s onward, who lived in Delft until he was assassinated there by a Catholic crazy from another country in 1584 and then his tomb was put in the choir of the new church, which of course was converted to Protestant use, and pulpit was moved out to the nave, and where you used to have a high altar and choir stalls and so on, you very frequently in these converted Dutch Gothic churches get a national monument. Already right after it's finished in 1618, major work of marble and bronze by Hendrik de Keyser, famous architect. It is shown in 1620. It's so fresh and such a difficult space to represent that this man from Delft, Bartholomeus van Bossen, in 1620, depicts the real tomb in an imaginary Gothic environment. But around 1650, shortly after the Netherlands became an independent country, treaty of 
1648, there was this wave of pictures of the tomb in its real space. And here is Gerard Hookgeist in 1650, who began this whole movement of souvenirs, you might say, of uh, the tomb of William the Silent, the founder of independence in the Netherlands. And this actually is, I think, in Delft, more than Vermeer, the standard for fidelity to a particular site. I think in this case, you couldn't use a camera obscura in the dark environment of the church choir. Of course, this is flooded with electricity here. Um, but you could use the so-called perspective frame, the peep site with a picture frame and strings such as we know from Albrecht Durer and other artists. And I think he probably did, because the proportions and the overlaps and everything are so bang on as you can photograph them today. And uh, George, there's Nancy 35 years ago in the <laughs> picture, my wife once upon a time, and still, and, uh, incidentally. And here is uh, a spin-off by Hoop Geist of his five-foot picture. This one is only a foot and a half high. He arbitrarily drops the column in the foreground here, gives us a slightly more open view. And these are so-called grave boards up here, which bear the family crests of the princes, who are all to this day and in the future. I had the pleasure of showing this picture to Prince Willem Alexander at my opening and was wondering what he's thinking, because he's going to be buried under that floor. And he knows it. He must look at this picture just a little differently than anyone else. It is a very big deal when the member of the House of Orange uh, is, is buried. Uh, even in the 20th century, and carriages proceed from The Hague to Delft and go under the floor of this church and into the crypt, into the royal tomb. So it's not just the tomb of William the Silent, but the tomb of the dynasty that has been the figureheads of the country for hundreds of years. I'm just showing you another view of the tomb, this one by Emmanuel de Vitte, who moved from Delft to Amsterdam around 16... 52, and this is 1656, so he's not even in the city anymore, but he's still got an art market for doing tombs, uh, views of the tomb of William the Silent. This is William's son, Frederick Hendrick, who was the main prince of Orange from his brother's death in 1625 to his own death in 1647, and an international tastemaker in terms of architecture, sculpture, and painting during the 1620s through the 1640s. And this is a portrait by the conservative court portraitist uh, Michiel van Meervelt, who again lives in Delft and is cranking out dozens, in fact, people said in his day thousands, he had a big studio, of uh, formal portraits like this one for the courtiers and anyone else who had the money to pay uh, for I mean, he was in big demand, so it was uh, like going to Andy Warhol, only different, to get a portrait done. And here's a, a more the flavor of the court. Here is the king and queen of Bohemia, cousins of Frederick Kendrick. They're kicked out of Prague after one winter. They're called the Winter King and Queen. They lost their throne due to a revolution in 1620, and by 1621, they're sponging off their cousins. They're all Protestants in, in The Hague, and were really tastemakers for the next two decades. But this little drawing by uh, Adrian van de Venne really captures the flavor of the court. When I was an undergraduate, the story of Dutch art was that it was a middle class culture and every picture was a cheap thing that went into a private home. Everyone was Protestant and middle class or less than that. And uh, you know, it's, it's generally true, but today and in the 17th century, 30% of the population was Catholic. In the 17th century, people took nobility dead seriously and they still, in some circles today, 
um, mostly not today, but you know, certain stuffy circles. So uh, it is you know, important to realize that uh, you get a different kind of society in the Netherlands in the 17th century, depending on what city you're in. Amsterdam is the wild and crazy New York port equivalent, and The Hague is like Washington in the 50s, kind of stuffy, and you know, it's the administration. And uh, you know, if, if you go to the opera in Washington today, you see people in jeans and they cost 15 bucks and they're Wranglers. And if you go to the opera in New York today, you see people in jeans and they cost $300 and they're, they're Gucci's. And it's, it's a slightly different tone. And you get something like that between Hague and Amsterdam in the 17th century. Frederick Hendrick had a number of palaces very near The Hague and Delft. This is the Palace of Hanselersdijk with the beach in the distance, the North Sea, we're looking west. You can see formal gardens in the French mode and he had paintings in it like that Rubens and Franz Snyders, which is now in Potsdam, thanks to relatives of the Court of Orange. Here is the palace at Ryswick, which is between The Hague and Delft. So one and a half miles outside the city gates of Delft is this grand palace with formal gardens and a beautiful wash drawing of it by a wealthy amateur from The Hague called Jan de Bishop. Uh, shows what the palace looks like from the side around 1650. And here, the, uh, still the queen's residence, the house ten Bas or the house in the wood built in the 1640s, which at the death of Frederick Hendrick in 1647 became something of a shrine to him, and that is the Oranjasal or Orange Hall on the right, the center room of this palace built in the late 1640s with this triumph of Frederick Hendrick by the Flemish artist Jacob Jordaens, the biggest shot you could get in the 1640s in Northern Europe at least after Van Dyck and Rubens had already died. In 1650, this young man dies, William II. Uh, we see him here by Van Dyck at the court of The Hague uh, around 1632, but he dies at about the age of 22 in 1650, and then power shifts to Amsterdam. But Delft basically remains the same. It is no longer near an important court but its model of society is really set by that time. And this family portrait sort of captures the flavor of Delft society in the 1640s. It's by a painter who turns to architectural pictures later on in the 50s. This is Hendrik van Fleet in 1640, showing the wealthy Catholic family of Michiel van der Dussen, a big name in Delft. And they're among the few families that, even in paintings, tended to wear their religion on their sleeves. The, that was not an easy thing. You could not be a, uh, I mean, you know, some Protestants had Catholic relatives and it was a comparatively tolerant culture, but you could not hold public office and there were other restrictions, depending on how stupid your neighbors were, how prejudiced they might be. Of course, the arch Calvinists made life tough. But here you actually see a crucifix in the background and a few religious pictures. There's an image of, uh, that is a little ivory sculpture of Mary and St. John below the ivory cross in the background. He was a neighbor of a wealthy nobleman named Peter van Rauven on the outer Delft, the main drag of Delft. And Peter van Rauven was the man who bought about half of Vermeer's work as it was produced. And this is quite a thing for Vermeer's studies. It, of course, goes back to uh, the discoveries and archives of a man named Michael Montius at Yale University. He died recently economic historian, and he made the link between this famous sale in 1696 of the son-in-law of Peter van Rauven and all of these pictures going back, in fact, to Vermeer's time in Delft and then through documents linked 
loans and payments to Vermeer and so on. And it's absolutely the truth that Vermeer had a patron in Delft, a minor nobleman who had the right of first refusal for his work, which was a common idea at the time. And I think he wasn't a Catholic, Van Rauven, but this man who lived next to him was, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was he who commissioned the allegory of Catholic faith, which is such an exceptional picture for Vermeer, a comparatively late one, done around 1670, and we'll get back to that. Incidentally, one point here, though. Note the tiled floor. They did not exist in this culture except the foyers of a few palaces. And there were a few imitations in paint on floor occasionally, but you don't want a marble floor in a cold country. It's hard on your tootsies, you know. And you, what you want is a nice, warm oak plank floor. That's what sensible people had, and these people are really rich. All of these floors, and you even see them in the views of church interiors, are made up out of perspective treatises to sort of create space and be a virtuoso display of know-how in creating space. And that is true for Vermeer's interiors too. None of those middle class or even upper middle class living rooms that Vermeer depicted actually had tiled floors. The first work by Vermeer that we know, I think, is the Diana and her companions of about 1654. It's in The Hague at the Moritz House, and there you see it in the 2001 exhibition at the Met, and it is together. It worked, I don't know if you remember it, but it worked rather well on the wall with these earlier Delft paintings that, in terms of their composition, big figural compositions that fill the frames, a sort of preference for primary colors, local coloring, uh, and uh, a certain format, a certain kind of tame classicism, you might say, was very common in Delft, uh, fairly conservative, like the taste for the most part at the court of The Hague. And you could see that in the exhibition, and you can see it in the works that were on the wall. This is William Van Fleet, the uncle of Hendrik, in 1627, an allegory of deceit. Fascinating picture. I know the owner in Brooklyn. It's going to come on the market soon if you're interested. <laughs> and thinking slightly north of a million, you can pick up this fascinating picture. And a much less accomplished picture, but interesting for the world that Vermeer comes out of is this capture of Samson inspired by Rubens, but uh, really looking more like a really anemic contourist, something like that. You know, Hontorst from Utrecht, who was a pioneer of Caravagesque painting in the Netherlands and the darling of the court patrons right next to Delft. So this kind of figural painting impressed Vermeer than he was when he was young. In fact, there is probably no more predictable subject for a young man who's about 22 years old in 1653 than Diana and her companions. It was such a favorite at court because she's the goddess of hunting. Hunting is such a popular sport when you've got country houses and a retinue to chase foxes and things like that. You would see court ladies appearing in the guise of Diana. So this was really a predictable subject for an ambitious young painter like Vermeer, who just joined the guild in Delft in 1654. Forgive this terrible slide. Pretend it's in black and white. But uh, the composition is what counts here. Another darling of the court was this man, Jakob van Loo. L-O-O, -O. and this is his Diana and Companions of 1648. He works in Amsterdam. He's a major painter of nude figures, although not in this case. And actually, that's surprising. Usually, artists seize the opportunity with Diana and other mythological subjects to paint female nudes. And in this case, they're all dressed because the lady, with her highly individualized features, is a portrait in this case, somewhat exceptionally, and the other figures are imaginary. So Vermeer is probably looking at various compositions by Van Loo and artists like him, this sort of descending wall of figures right in the foreground, something like half a pediment. 
but he may also have gone to Amsterdam and seen something much more profound. This is Rembrandt right around the same time, himself doing a kind of classical relief composition which is appropriate for such a serious subject as, uh, as Bathsheba when she's called to King David's bed. And of course, she's already married to one of his generals who's going to be killed off by David. And a maid is preparing her tootsies. I said that the second time. I'm on a tootsie kick tonight. Uh, and I don't even have a thing about feet. Anyway. <laughs> It is interesting in reverse for Vermeer's composition and in its seriousness. I mean, this is Rembrandt right after Aristotle treating the subject of a woman unwillingly called to the king's bed dead seriously, sort of putting himself as much as he can into her position. And clearly she cannot refuse, but there's considerable regret. You may know this picture in its older state, which is this uh, mostly the addition in the 19th century of sky in the background, which is uh, somewhat embarrassing for people who have described this sky in relationship to other Vermeers and why those suspicious Vermeers are actually by the same artist. Well, they might be since the sky is actually a 19th century repainting. And when, was, when this was discovered by means of cross-sections and autoradiography at the Moritz house, that sky was covered over. It's still there. If you feel strongly about it, we can take this off eventually. But a sort of wall of vegetation was placed on top of the sky to recreate what is actually under that sky. So this is as close as we can get today to what Vermeer's original composition looked like. It was also slightly wider on the left side so that this sort of pediment of figures was more symmetrical. In the old days, uh, people would wonder what are Diana and her companions kind of so mild-mannered and thoughtful about. And Arthur Wheelock actually explains maybe it's the recent explosion in Delft that blew up a third of the town. I don't know why Diana back in antiquity would have strong thoughts on that subject, but there are various speculations about why this picture is so reserved. It's clearly not a portrait, but it's hardly the typical nude babe splashing around in the forest either. And I think the secret is actually this figure in the background who in the old state looks like nothing more than a kind of marker in space on the way into depth. And now, with this darker background, becomes something much more prominent. And in fact, she's Callisto. She is the girl who got pregnant, and that is something you just don't do in Diana's merry virginal band. That's the rules. These are all virgins, and Diana, the goddess of the moon and the hunt, is the leader of this pack of virgins in antiquity. You know, Actaeon stumbles into it and gets transformed into a stag just for looking at these babes, and Zeus comes down and impregnates in the form of Diana, that rotten snake transforms himself into Diana, seduces Callisto, she gets pregnant, and she's holding her hands protectively in front of her belly, which is actually rather swollen, and uh, she's wearing this odd kind of quasi-modern dress. It's actually 16th century, and looking very gloomy since Diana has just said, we're all hot from the chase, it's a muggy day, let's take our clothes off and splash in the water. And according to Ovid's Metamorphosis, one girl shrinks back and, you know, huddles in her clothing, and that is Callisto in the background. This is a guy who just got married, Vermeer. It could even be a tribute to his wife. And I rather wonder if the young lady, who is the only one in contemporary clothing, the most loyal of Diana's band in the foot washing scene in the foreground, is in fact a portrait of Katerina Bolness, Vermeer's wife. But we just don't have independent evidence for what she actually looked like. Incidentally, the dog in the other corner is a traditional symbol of fidelity, 
And this is a thorn plant. Uh, I forget actually which plant it is, but some kind of pricker bush, which is meant to suggest the hard path of virtue, like Hercules at the, uh, the crossroads between virtue and vice. Just show you quickly two details of this which are interesting for the very white light and the reflections. And here, what I think, although some people view it differently, but I think is a more mature work by Vermeer than the Diana and the Companions, this very large canvas in Edinburgh, Christ in the House of Mary and Martha. It is when you see it in the actual flesh, it is so bold and monumental. It's about five feet high. The viewpoint is very low, like an altarpiece, or you feel like you're on a stool like Martha here in the foreground looking up at these figures. And Vermeer, who was born into a Protestant family, converted in 1653 to Catholicism to marry the woman he loved and seems to have taken it seriously. And I'll bet he started going around looking at Catholic altarpieces like he never had before and like most artists in Delft would not. And this really, this format is pretty much the, a bold design of the 1620s. If you think of Tobruggen or Rubens, to do a kind of monochrome background there's a suggestion of a corridor with an open door and another room, but basically it all serves to project the figures forward like colored sculpture. It's really monumental and uh, quite a bold and accomplished statement after the much more timid design of the Diana and her companions. I'll just show you a very washed out slide, but it gives you a better idea of the folds in this picture. At the same time that it's sculptural and monumental, it's really so agitated in the drapery. You know, Christ has just, uh, Martha in the background is the fuss budget, and according to the Bible, she's saying to this visitor that they don't recognize, but they're religious ladies, Mary and Martha, not any Mary that we know from elsewhere in the Bible, and Martha complains to Christ, I'm slaving in the kitchen, and all Martha does is sit here and listen to you and your nice words about saving humanity, and so on. And he says, Martha, Martha, you're such a busy head, but Mary has chosen the better part and, you know, wants the real stuff to chew on or whatever metaphor is in the Bible. And the drapery, I think, is wonderfully expressive of that. The way there is this kind of busyness in Christ's arm and the, the agitation which gets greater as it comes down to Martha, the way the blue of his robe continues into her skirt, and even this business right behind the hand, look what Vermeer does with the drapery there. It's a little like lightning bolt in the heavens, the sky split and just, you know, to fold the white drapery like that gives some consequence to the gesture that it wouldn't have if that were just a blank background. And then the kind of agitation here in, in the sleeve of Martha, who's just been scolded and is looking very demure, kind of sexy, but, you know, also demure with the downcast eyes. There are so many lowered eyelids in Vermeer that say many different things. And in this picture, it's somehow very sensual and, and very scolded at the same time as she sets down the bread, which hasn't quite touched the table yet. Wonderful shadow under there. If we look at a few other paintings by other artists, I think basically what Vermeer has done in this picture, and it's a theme that uh, you'll see in other paintings too, he has combined two different styles, and he's seen their potential for mixing like no other artist had before him, I think. One is the monumentality of Tobruggen, working in a Caravagesque way in Utrecht in here 1621, the famous painting by Tobruggen in Oberlin, Ohio, 
of St. Sebastian, St. Irene and her maid, nearly life-size, monumental sculptural figures in the foreground. This slide has lost its color a bit, but it is quite monotonal in the background. And I think Vermeer has basically combined that monumentality of Dutch painting in the 1620s with something slightly later, the agitation of Van Dyck's religious pictures of the 1630s. Here the Virgin and Child with St. Uh, Catherine in the Metropolitan, which was done right around the time that Van Dyck came up briefly to Holland and worked at the Dutch court in 1632. And the busyness of the folds and the kind of flowing lines of the composition are picked up in Vermeer's picture. Incidentally, the figure type here and the design with stripes, which in some places seem to flow right out of the carpet and into the headdress. And you see the way the carpet sort of embraces this figure and makes her bigger visually than she would be. Otherwise, there are so many contours in Vermeer that lead into each other and are really significant. He's uh, a master of that kind of thing. In general, what you're seeing in these early works is a young artist surveying the stylistic possibilities of what he knows in his own art world. A bit of the past and a bit of what's contemporary. The first four or five pictures by Vermeer are all very different than each other and he's surveying the alternatives quite like Rembrandt did actually in his early work. We don't know who Vermeer's teacher is and if we ever find out someday, I don't think it's going to matter a damn because he's so independent and he's quite like the young Rembrandt doing this self-teaching program of looking at everything he can get his hands on, including of course direct observation in the environment that uh, he's really creating his, his own style by combining so many different possibilities. This is the, one of the very rare dated works in Dresden, dated 1656 by Vermeer, called the Procurus, which is the business of this older lady. And this is a customer who's flipping a coin into this young lady's hand, although she's no lady. And she is probably actually a waitress in a tavern who back in these days frequently functioned upstairs as well as downstairs. And actually, I think for the first time after 30 years, I finally figured out this white cloth, what it's doing right in that position. I, I always thought of it as kind of just covering a difficult space. And Vermeer didn't quite know what he's doing in that area, which spatially is true anyway. But actually, it's, it's her apron, and it hangs from her waist downward. And I think she's just been invited over to the table. And she sat down, and the apron has sort of laid on the table as she's bellied up to the edge of it. And anyway, that's one way to read it. It does clearly go right down into her lap. And on the left is a figure that I think in style is more naturalistic than any other figure in the composition. It almost looks like somebody in a mirror has placed themselves in front of a painting, which is basically in the style of Utrecht in the 1620s. And that more naturalistic figure is probably a self-portrait of Vermeer with an expression that we just don't expect from this guy based on his later pictures, but it's certainly appropriate for this kind of subject. And it was a fairly steady tradition in the Netherlands of artists showing themselves, particularly in bordello scenes. If you know Rembrandt's self-portrait with his wife Saskia, also in Dresden, looking like the prodigal son and his girlfriend. So this is basically based on Utrecht Caravagesque painting. There are these wonderful moments of observation, the glasses, this gold piping on the sleeve with these little like oil drops catching light, uh, the light on the leaves decorating this fancy hat. Vermeer does this wonderful thing with texture of lace here, which is actually bumpy if you put your fingertips on it. And then as soon as you leave the lace and go into the linen, it's very filmy and milky. 
So he uses different kinds of paint, bumpy and smooth, to create different sort of textured effects. And this artist who, in the future, is a master of space, in his early works just can't quite handle it. Again and again, in the early works, he puts up some kind of barrier in the foreground, which works as a kind of foil to define and break up the picture plane. It's almost like the painted canvas is rumpled in this area, and then everything beyond this, which I read as a kind of balustrade or railing with a tapestry thrown over it. It's really kind of irrational and just made up for the picture. It's like a balcony, but it's really a first floor. What we have now that the picture's clean in the background, it's clear that we're in front of a big column here, a solid wall, and then it breaks into a deeper space. There's the base of the column. And that flame-like business is the suggestion of a hearth in the background, in some deeper space. So we're in some big sort of tavern. Here's an Utrecht composition, again, by Terbruggen, just to give you the general idea of the sort of uh, painting that big figure paintings that Vermeer is deriving this composition from. But the self-portrait itself you can trace all the way back to the early self-portraits of Rembrandt when clearly he's looking in a mirror at his own expression and studying not only expressions but the behavior of light coming in from a window behind him, the texture on the column and so on. One of his best pupils, Carol Fabricius, trained with Rembrandt in the 1640s and then moved to Delft and was important for Vermeer. This is what I think of as the Juan de Perea of the Netherlands, to cite that great painting by Velasquez in the Met. But this is Carol Fabricius' self-portrait in Rotterdam around 1645. Another thing that to me looks like a guy in a bathroom mirror. The light is that convincing and the textures too. And a recently attributed to uh, Fabricius self-portrait in Munich, which, although it's been mucked about by restoration, does seem to be actually by him. Now, we get to painting number five by Vermeer, and I'll be moving more quickly, shortly, through later work, but I really think that the early works are formative and quite important, and you see Firstly, in this large painting, which you know quite well in the Met, the Maid Asleep of about 1657, a similar business with carpets in the foreground. This kind of table with the edge of the carpet pushed up, this barrier to intrusion into the space and then the chair to the side. Rather, as in Christ in the house of Mary and Martha, we break into a deeper space in the background and then a figure right against the wall as in this case, but for the first time, we have a realistic environment, a real domestic interior, possibly a real model, possibly the same one that was in the Diana and her companions to the lower right. It's actually the same dress that she's wearing and somewhat similar in the face, although we don't see it in profile. The subject you may know is an overdressed maid who's fallen asleep after entertaining a boyfriend and she's got a glass of wine in front of her. A beer glass, quite abraded now, is in the foreground next to a, a wine pitcher. A chair with a pillow in the foreground. There used to be a dog there looking at a man leaving in the back room, which is actually under this layer of paint. And Vermeer, this is so typical of him, especially in his early works, he's constantly editing himself, repainting, in a way which makes the picture more discreet, more suggestive, less obvious in its meaning. In this case, a kind of dreamy, overdressed maid who in the middle of a sunny afternoon is drinking wine, dozing, and thinking about the guy who just left. And this scenario is suggested to the intelligent viewer of the day simply by that fat little baby leg up in this picture who is Cupid, who we recognize from other pictures by Vermeer, and a mask 
fallen on the ground. Love unmasked, which was a common phrase in Shakespeare and other writers of the day. And that's what the sleep of reason shows us on this lady's face, is the love being unmasked. The style of this picture is inspired by, again, another artist, in good part, Nicholas Moss, Rembrandt's pupil in Amsterdam, who uses these velvety shadows and these warm brown palette and figures seated frontally against a wall next to a table. The composition is very frequent in his work, and Vermeer breaks it up in a way which is distinctive of Vermeer, but he is looking at that Rembrandt pupil. Here's another Nicholas Moss where the rectilinear design that he favors is a little more obvious. But then when you look at the details in Vermeer, he is combining our ideas for the composition from different artists. But whatever he borrows, and this is really a basic point for the lecture and for Vermeer in general, whatever he borrows, he mixes together different sources, maybe two or three or even more from artists who come from different towns. He sees how the combination might work. And then he tests whatever he borrows, it seems, against direct observation in the environment. Yes, Nicholas Moss does it that way, but what if I put a model behind a table against a wall? What does it look like in reality? I think he's constantly testing what he sees in realistic painting against reality, and that's something that most of these painters did not do, that they just generated, for the most part, art out of art. So it's a very complicated play in Vermeer between art learning and independent observation. One other artist in Holland was really remarkable for that combination of art learning and observation, and that was the young Rembrandt. Quickly just show you a couple of details. I don't think you could borrow this from another painter, this complicated play of diaphanous drapery over a little jug on its side with a fruit bowl, wine decanter, very abraded beer glass rumor on its side, a knife, a spoon facing each other, and then this sort of wedge, a pyramid, Rock of Gibraltar here, which is echoed in the pyramid of the pillow on the chair, the triangle of that, the way the seesaw of lions on the back of the chair sort of tips on the post of the door here, and the way the door is open halfway so that we get half solid, half sudden light to this background. The proportions of the picture frame, which was actually enlarged in a repainting, all of the proportions in this picture, I mean, it, it looks accidental. You know that if you were in this room looking down at that table and you just shifted your head a little bit, the whole composition would change. And you sense that kind of parallax in the picture. But at the same time, the way it is, Vermeer knows that things are constantly moving in reality and they don't move at all in real pictures. And he exploits that distinction and makes some very subtle compositional adjustments. The way the mirror in the background that replaced a man, the proportions of that window against the table in the back of the room. All of these things are, I think, exquisitely balanced with his own sense of proportion. But then you turn to these zips of daylight on the door, and there's no source in that for in, in art for that, I think. And really remarkable, I can't think of anything beforehand uh, in Dutch painting or elsewhere that uh, looks quite like that blinding flash of white light on the door jam. And uh, can't think of much else until you get up to Manet and Degas, I would say. In the letter reader in Dresden, which is a big picture, surprisingly big, small painting style, the kind of pictures you see from Leiden artists on a very small scale. But now Vermeer is suddenly doing something much more illusionistic than the made asleep in this picture with this 
letter reader of about 1657 reflected in a window with this curtain hanging in the foreground as if it's a curtain over the picture with a brass rail and rings at the top. For the last time, we get this kind of impediment in the foreground of a table that creates a foreground and the lady is in the middle ground behind this curtain, which actually in the first painting didn't exist. There was a large beer glass in the foreground, no curtain, and the painting of Cupid on the back wall, right here, making it much more rectilinear. He completely removed the painting on the back wall, eliminated the beer glass, put in the curtain, and as a result, you've got a kind of bare and tall and somewhat confining space, which of course is beautifully expressive because these pictures are bought by gentlemen. This was bought by this nobleman, Peter van Rauven. He is looking at a beautiful young lady for the first time. It's a woman of a gentleman's own class in fancy dress, not Diana from mythology, etc., from the Bible or uh, the maid asleep, but uh, this time an upscale young lady of marriageable age. And it's a painting, in a sense, about voyeurism, about being attracted and restrained culturally at the same time. And you're, you're literally pulled into the picture by things and kept out by other things at the same time. It's rather effective psychologically in that way. The business of reflecting the woman in the mirror, of course, is wonderful for that. And she's actually reflected to match the pose that this young lady was originally in. As, as in Young Women in Turbort, she was turned slightly into the background. And then Vermeer repainted the figure to be in strict profile like this. And maybe you can see even her dress was different. She's got bare skin here and a lower neckline. And now she's got this high white collar. And he, he sort of, I think teasingly, just doesn't bother to change that, that detail. Uh, he is looking at painters in Delft who use illusionistic curtains. This is Hukkist again in a small panel doing this highly illusionistic church interior now in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Look at this little thing going on down here. It's interesting for later Vermeers of a cavalier chatting up a young lady in church. Hi, babe, you live around here? You come here often? Not that, you know, especially appropriate conversation for church, but something which would appeal to uh, the picture's buyer, probably. And then this wonderfully illusionistic space and light. You might almost think of Vermeer's figure as the column in this picture in stylistic terms. But in terms of figure painting, he's looking at uh, the most successful of genre painters at this time, and that's Gerard Turbork, B-O-R-C-H, who is very big in The Hague next door and famous for these satin dresses and these exquisite small pictures of lovely young ladies who sort of know they're being spied on, but not really. Again, a kind of uh, male fantasy of dropping into a young lady's boudoir while she's playing with some fancy little thing that she's just put on looking in the mirror. And the maid has this different expression, like, you know, is this girl for real? Does she really think she's that pretty? And then holding the symbol of purity, actually, this basin and pitcher and a brush and a comb on the edge of a table, which also symbolizes purity, these little tokens to remind you of the meaning of the picture, um, but worn in a very light way. Turbork is interested more in the psychology of people's behavior and especially the way pretty young women behave. And uh, Vermeer, I think, sees that sensitivity to real people in the work of Turbork. For other things like the design of the window and the uh, way the corner space is created, he's looking at a good number of artists in the whole area of South Holland. This is an artist you probably would know named Isaac Kudijk from London, uh, Leiden. The important thing is that the date of this picture called The Empty Glass is 1648. And quite a few artists were doing this conventional 
a lead-in from the left with a window wall and a corner of space and sometimes a doorway to the side. Of course, Peter de Hoek picks it up a little later and Vermeer picks up that spatial format from a number of other artists. There's a gentleman messing around with a kitchen maid in the background. Uh, and that's interesting for the real meaning of Vermeer's milkmaid, which you'll see in just a second. In the Frick collection is this painting of about the same time, The Cavalier and Girl by Vermeer, where he is designing with a string. There's actually a pinhole in the surface of this picture, and he would attach strings to the pin and stretch to get the window right. Extremely short uh, distance here. Uh, that is, he uses this perspective construction to make us feel very close to the picture plane. So we're sort of looking down on the table and very close to the figures and therefore there's a sort of jump in scale or one should really say size from the man in the foreground to the to the woman in the middle distance and that has led some people to think that Vermeer is using a camera and of course we have seen people using cameras in the 1920s 30s in this expressive way with someone very big in the foreground but what the uh, pin in the picture and a great deal else about it tells us, I think, is that Vermeer is actually constructing the picture from scratch and then testing those formats that he borrows from other painters against reality. Actually, Peter de Hoek, at the very same time, here around 1657, is experimenting with the same kind of interior space and even with the sort of light on the back of a figure near the window this light effect, the way it falls here, the way it falls into her lap and on her hands, is an idea that you'll find in other pictures of the time, but never handled quite so realistically, so observationally as you see it in Vermeer. A terrible slide, but here an important composition to look at. This is Hantorst in 1620. 50, 30 years later, Vermeer is, in a sense, doing a modern version of that composition. That silhouetted figure, that girl in light, here because of candlelight. This is Hantorst, the Procurus, in 1621. The figure scheme is modernized here, and he splices in behind it the style of doing spaces that we see in Peter de Hoek, and then he looks at reality and makes both those sources much more realistic. It was even going on in tapestries in Delft at the time. This is a tapestry of the 1640s by Calvin Burke with this silhouetted figure in the background and this woman across the table and a curtain illusionistically between columns. And of course this is a very crude composition in tapestry on a large scale made by weavers, but it is one of the middlemen between Hantorst and Vermeer uh, working in Delft. A similar composition by de Hoek in Switzerland, the card players, uh, very different figures, but similar scheme of arranging the figures at a luminous table close to a window. Look at, for example, the way the chair is angled against the wall and the way the shadows play here against the finials, the way the light... I think this would have been considered very clever, and it is, by painters of the day. The reflection there, but then on the shadowy side of the figure, light coming from somewhere else or bouncing off the wall or who knows what, off the mirror, off of other luminous surfaces. Obviously there's another light source somewhere inside this room. So there's some very subtle light and shadow effects going on in this area, quite as they are in the case of Vermeer. The figure itself is uh, an extraordinary study in light and I think this is one case where whether Vermeer is looking at reality or at a camera-like device, I, I'm not really sure, but he uses this stippling effect, 
and this point delay effect in different surfaces, in different places, and he varies it according to what he's representing. So when it's gold stripes on fabric, it looks like one thing. When it's reflecting on polished wood, it looks like another thing. Uh, and then there's things you can hardly explain in terms of uh, borrowing from other artists. The light on the hands on the glass and so on are really quite remarkable. This is the, the milkmaid and it's interesting to look at these two pictures together. This is very small. This is about 14 inches high. It looks so monumental and they're about the same date, around 1647. And this picture is so, you might say, optical in its values, so much values of light and shadow. This is really the last sculptural figure in Vermeer, really solid kind of figure. And I think Vermeer is looking at Leiden painters who have this very tactile sense. He's looking at uh, Carol Fabrizius and Dolph, who's doing an illusionistic object like a bird on a perch in front of a bright wall and that creates a very relief-like effect. Here is Metsu in Leiden where you get this very tactile approach to objects, the bowl, the woman, the plants, and so on. And he is admiring that in the sculptural quality of the woman, the tactility of her clothing, the little foot warmer to the lower right and everything on the table and then putting this kind of milk spray or whatever it is of speckled light on top of the bread which suggests the kind of flicker of daylight and the quality of breadcrumbs at the very same time and then the business in the background of the basket contrasted with the brass and the reflections on the wall and the plaster wall there is both optical and sculptural or tactile values going on in this picture at the same time. Milkmaids, incidentally, were among the most seductive thing that a gentleman could think of in this period. And my colleague, Arthur Wheelock, in Washington, calls this picture one of the most dignified, reserved, monumental, virginal, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's really the Madonna of the cow meadows for my friend Arthur. And I'm afraid he's not thinking what this picture would have meant to a gentleman in this period. And of course, Vermeer is so subtle that we don't see it. We don't think of this woman as seductive. But if you knew the diaries from this period, like Samuel Pepys, and just the habits of upscale gentlemen when they went to inns and, hey, boy, that girl in the kitchen looks pretty good, and zoom, they're in there, you know, and making propositions and, and so on. And there was, in Dutch culture, for 200 years before this, these stories about milkmaids. I mean, you may not like it, but it's true. It goes back to engravings by Lucas van Leiden and so on. Here, for example, there's a milkmaid by Franz Snyders or a member of his studio pouring milk and the point is the vessel, which back in these days any doctor would tell you and any artist would tell you that a woman's womb and vagina, excuse me, were shaped exactly like that. That's what they thought. Anyway, that it was used in medical textbooks as a diagram and so on. And as a result, this kind of milk jug was considered hilarious in dirty pictures and is meant to suggest a sort of sexual overture. There's other symbolic forms, birds and cabbages, and I don't have time to go into it, but you can see this sort of kitschy coo look in the eyes. And this is a long tradition for generations before Vermeer. He treats it so subtly, and what's on the girl's mind? Does she know we're looking at her? Seemingly not, but there's this little smile on her lips. It is again about voyeurism. It's about the male viewer being drawn into the picture, but also being held at a distance, knowing he can't enter this tiny little illusionistic world for reasons of culture and for reasons that it's just an illusion, just a painting. It's really meant to be rather complicated psychologically, rather like watching a 
a film with uh, a racy subject matter today. Incidentally, there are little cupids on the floor tiles. The foot warmer was a naughty um, symbol in these days. Basically, it suggested hot pants because you put your feet on it to get your, your feet warm. And uh, again, the jug is used repeatedly in pictures like this sexy little drawing by a man named Jakob Bakker of the 1640s. These girls are always cute and uh, somehow their innocence is very attractive. Incidentally, again, uh, Vermeer has used a pinhole and a string in this composition and there in the x-ray you actually see evidence of uh, the pin. Now, what should I do about time? Some of you have to go. I could use another 10 or 15 minutes or so at, at least. Keep, keep rolling and, you know, if you go storming out of here, uh, that's okay, I understand. Um, but we will move quickly, and I know this is frustrating. I'm not looking at these pictures like some of you would like to look at them, and maybe it'd be better to come back and just look at maybe five or six slides at a time. But this one, I think, is really important for our subject. It's uh, Vermeer's 1658 glass of wine in Berlin, which was in the Delft show of 2001, and a Peter de Hoek of the same moment. And this, these, they, they were fashions for a year or two in picture design, just like there were fins on Cadillacs for one or two years and then they disappear. And this kind of boxy interior with frequently ceiling beams, floor tiles in a very demonstrative way, figures at a table in the middle ground, frequently some fancy furniture in the background. This is the education of the Virgin by Peter de Hoek, so it's a kind of comment on this uh, young lady and her suitors who have dropped by to visit her, and the other woman is a maid. And Vermeer shows a young lady in her own house with a visiting gentleman who doesn't bother to take his hat off that wasn't so discourteous at the time, but he's clearly not living there. He is a suitor who was in this chair in the foreground. He was playing that citern. We see songbooks spilling right off the table and off the chair as well. And he's been singing songs to her. And she's such a stiff prude that hasn't melted the ice whatsoever. And then Vermeer shows you that in her pose, this sort of, it looks like the old Ed Sullivan show, you know, where he comes out <laughs> like this and keeps the elbows in tight. And I mean, this guy's coming on to her, and what does the pose say? Absolutely straight in that chair with her butt kicked back against the back of the chair. I mean, it's like she's part of the chair and keeping, you know, really closed up. This is not throwing your arm over the back of the chair and saying, let's have another drink. And he's standing there just waiting for her to finish that sip. So this didn't work. The music didn't work. He runs around here, pours a glass of wine. And this drapery is wonderful here. It's almost like a graph of his last move or his next move. You see the way you've got this white linen and sort of nimbus of uh, linen around the jug of wine. It's like a linchpin for the whole composition. And then that drift of drapery lifting right up into her glass. And you can pretty much put your eye at any spot in this composition and let it take you somewhere. My friend George Dean in the audience uh, paints uh, similar compositions to Vermeer. And he says this wonderful thing about his own work when he's stuck. He looks at Vermeer, and Vermeer shows him what to do, what to do next. And I really believe it. When you look, for example, I think I have a detail here. Well, that's bad color of the window. Now, I, I don't want to ignore the astonishing light effects and the amount of time, probably two weeks for the window alone, and all of this observation. But for a moment, look at what he's done with the composition. For example, here, we've got the neck of the sitter. It turns as if it's gone clockwise into the back of the chair with another head, which is the lion, and then the next one. We've sort of been turned clockwise down into these songbooks. 
From there, we can drop into the chair with the stripes of the sitter and down right onto the floor like that. And then there's all of these stretchers in the chair, which take the checkerboard pattern, sort of diffuse it geometrically, lead it up into the stripes of the sitter, which go back in that direction. Look at where the table carpet comes down. It's like marquetry. It's right on the edge of this bench against the wall. And then this little drop at an angle, which brings you into that. And then on the other side, where we could have this gap, he drops that corner of the tablecloth. And we've gone over this busy pattern. There's many interesting patterns. I mean, he's doing this for a connoisseur. And they don't have a TV to look at. They want to look at this picture for two hours. And sometimes they're looking not at the subject or the illusion of the whole, but they're just perusing every damn detail in it and saying, how beautiful, how clever. So you get over here, that stripe leads right up into this stripe. But if you've gone that way, OK, we can take those stripes and come up with the folds into our arm. And then we've got, of course, the branching of the decoration on her jacket. The way her arm here, we've gone from here up and then right into his contour. Then that collar turns down. It cuts the picture frame. It leads through the sleeve. And I think of this turned up page as a kind of echo to the collar that is turned down. He's put the picture, which is a very murky landscape, suggesting dark woods and a little bit of danger. It was a symbol of romance at the time, dangerous business in romance. It's like it's the choir at the end of this nave here, the way the table recedes back to that, and it's directly above. And uh, the way all of these shapes work, and then Philip Stedman in England comes along and writes a book called Vermeer's Camera and says this whole damn setup was in the corner of a real room in front of Vermeer's eyes, and he just traced it in a dark box, grinding lapis lazuli and six other pigments and mixing it together and basically painting in the dark on top of the image. What is this guy thinking? Is he ever been in the studio? But all you have to do is see this, these extremely subtle relations of shape of the way one form, the neck here also leads you into the pillow in the corner and then up into the curtain and it just never stops. And of all the pictures by Vermeer that you might say work like clockwork, this one does. Uh, and actually Vermeer never does it to this extent again. If you just go forward to the next painting in the Frick collection, which is badly damaged, there are some similarities, but it's a pretty loose composition by comparison, which I think is sort of spun out of this one, derived from, again, the idea of the man coming on to the woman, leaning over her. What, how that shape relates to this one. He's standing too close. He looks like some kind of monument right next to her. This girl's got a different attitude entirely. She's looking at you and saying, yeah, I know what he's about. And he's handing me music, but he uses it as this sort of excuse to put his arms around me. And there's this beautiful wine picture, again, a kind of linchpin. I, I, I don't want to lose this for a second. That chair, parallel to this chair, their distance from that point, the way this plane works against that plane, these different turnings in space. and the gorgeous light on the back of that chair. I mean, suddenly in the middle of busyness, you've got a totally blue parallelogram, intense blue with these white specks of light on it. So this is four months' work put together very carefully. And uh, the idea that it was produced essentially by an optical machine is just downright Philistine. Tell your <laughs> friends and neighbors that's the case. <laughs> I feel strongly about this. Uh, we'll skip over uh, a couple of comparisons, but uh, here I just want to show you, this is in Braunschweig, another closely related picture. There's these three date from 16. 
58 to 60. And this picture, I think, is a bit of a flop. He's um, looking at Franz Van Mieris, who goes over the top with stagey expressions, the quack doctor visiting the lovesick lady. It's all a charade. He's not a real doctor. She's not really sick. She's just swooning with uh, love problems, and he's given her a urine sample, which he holds up to the light and says, gee, it's kind of pink. Uh, your gallbladder shot or something like that. And uh, you see that kind of surprisingly exaggerated expressions for Vermeer in this picture. And in both the stagey figures and the illusionism, both of these paintings are small, but the one on the right is only about that high and bad color in the slide, of course. So it's a bit out of character for Vermeer. But after looking at the Berlin picture, the glass of wine, look at this form of this man. Do I actually have the Berlin painting? No. Um, the way this form works like some kind of mountain in China or something, it's just too damn symmetrical here. It's sort of a sheet of cardboard with some folds, and then a hand and a head pop out of it forward. And what are we going to do here? He comes down to the table. What is this man's spatial relationship to that table? He's close to the woman. He's next to the table. But which is it really? Well, it's not clear. So what do we do? We throw a big tablecloth right in there where the space isn't quite clear. And yes. It leads into her knee, it leads into him, it carries up to there. But it sure doesn't work like that Berlin picture. And I think although there's beautiful passages of painting in this picture, um, it's just not put together to the same degree. There's wonderful aspects, the reflection. I think it's much more beautiful in its execution and its light effects than it is in the uh, design of it. Do you agree with that? Do you see it or disagree? Or I mean, it's interesting to see Vermeer screwing up a little bit. And then you realize how wonderfully put together the most successful ones are. Um, I don't, uh, let me just quickly go through some fly, slides and I won't say everything I, I wanted to say about them, but uh, the Little Street, 1658, uh, also inspired by Peter de Hoek around the same time, pictures like this. These paintings were collector's items where painters showed off their brick walls and ability to paint textures, bricks, light effects, and so on. There is a nice subject here. It's a very old house, 200 years old. The body of the house, and you might say the soul of the house and the family that currently lives in it, is in something of an improvement on the kind of domestic subject that Peter de Hoek routinely did for middle class buyers. But I think it is also an essay in bricks for the collector. This is a Delft painter named Daniel Fosmar around the same time, doing this demolished wall of bricks with wonderful effects of plaster contrasted to that and the trees, the bit of Delft that blew up, so it's also rather poignant with these foundations now with grass growing. But it's really an essay in textures right on the surface. And Vermeer's picture, if you look more closely at it, now this painting is again that high. Imagine painting it yourself and you're doing this wooden shutter which is two inches high and you come to the edge and what do you do? You make a black line to suggest that it's set into the woodwork. How much more do we have here? Three planks, the middle one worn down more, the brick here, obviously this doorway has been reconstructed. It used to be an arch. They threw in a lintel. These bricks at the side are busting up as a result. It's carrying the weight of ages on top of it. These little dots of paint suggesting water and so on. But all of these extraordinary effects of texture and substance with oil paint on a really rather small scale. Um, it is a virtuoso performance and uh, really a low 
a rather domestic and simple subject. It's very much a, a picture for a man who knows paintings. Also, the blurry way that the uh, cobblestones, which are wet in the foreground, look sort of just like wavy lines and this line of water running in this channel here. You just have to, you know, go to the real picture and dwell on every square inch. And when you look at a good Vermeer book at home, turn some of these things upside down or sideways and look at the design and the details then. And you'll see things, I mean, I see things after 30 years that I never saw before in Vermeer. In the view in Delft, it is a, a remarkable exception for Vermeer, probably a commission from his patron. It too would have been four or five months work and it is so unrepresentative of a view of Delft. This is the standard approach by a man named Hendrik Frome back in 1615, show the two great churches, the canal from The Hague, fortifications, town hall, etc., shipping, business, whatever. It's a profile view which gives you a kind of inventory of the whole city with its mills and fortifications. Vermeer centers on the absolutely most picturesque corner of Delft. These two old gates which happen to be picked together and this bridge in between them. Here is another picturesque approach of the time. Again, Daniel Fosmar. And this is, I think, typical of the 1660s, where a mill intrudes in the middle of the monuments and means nothing unless the guy who owns that mill commissioned the picture, which is not very likely. Uh, then this picture is about being picturesque water reflecting in the foreground. And he is nowhere near as capable as Vermeer, but it's a similar idea. I think this painting, the subject was chosen, this particular view of Delft, for two possible reasons. It is the most picturesque angle on the town, and Vermeer's patron lived right down that street. That's possible, but it's also the place that everybody landed when you came to Delft. This extraordinary little drawing by a man named Jan de Biscop shows that quay right there. We're walking along, it looks like a sidewalk of New York or something, where in broad daylight, we're walking past a big fortification that's right out here, and this little pillar is that one right there. Immediately, you see what Vermeer's done with the wall. All of this fortification, windows, plaster work or whatever, uh, falling off, the antiquity and quaintness of that monument there, and then this gate which comes straight out at a right angle from the quay here, whereas it spreads at a right angle here, and this whole wall has been something like a, become something like a board fence, very plain and long. He has stretched everything, the roof lines, the town wall, and the proportions of things in general. This a uh, gate, the so Rotterdam gate, should actually come straight out like that, and its shadow is reflected down below it, but he spreads it to the side, so it kind of flattens, and it becomes two things, this picture. It's highly illusionistic, and at the same time, it's classical in its design. And that classicism, that balance of horizontals with little vertical accents, gives the town a sort of tranquility and peacefulness in design, which I think was very pleasing to people who lived there at the time. After the 80 years war, we've had 15 years of peace. And this is what Delft looks now, uh, looks like now, which had been invaded, blown up, all kinds of problems. And this is uh, modern times, and it's a much more tranquil view, peaceful view of the city. A closer view, uh, as we did in that painting of the, uh, the glass of wine, you could look at different details down here. For example, look at these reflections, which we know from x-rays used to come down to here. And then Vermeer stretched them so that they came all the way down to the opposite bank. They used to end about here, and he drew them down in a repainting. This tower just happens to fall between those two posts. 
Ladies, you need a little room, you need some back room. Okay, light reflection behind you, behind the boat. And then over here, these uh, wonderful proportions, which I think if we look at, I think I have it, a drawing of the period. Here's what this gate actually looks like. And he simplified it, made it broader in its proportions, and then put this screen of dots on it. Here they describe mortar. Here it's the wet planks of wood in shadow, in a shadowy part of the boat, suggesting light bouncing off the surface, but it doesn't really bounce there. It's also on the shadowy side of here, and it's also on the highlighted side. So he's using this optical device, which suggests the scintillation of daylight and reflecting water. He's using it wherever he wants it to create this kind of overall impression of brilliant daylight. But he is certainly not just copying it from where he happens to see it. Actually, you can see right here that the whole boat is repainted and has gone transparent. It used to be ending right there, and then he wanted to bring out the back and make it look a little more sideways and continue this line. Now, I don't mean to neglect things like this. I mean, the reflection there, and you see this business in blue? That's a little wind right on the surface of the water. I've just never seen that. That's like those zips of light on the edge of the door frame. Suddenly, he does something. We think we've understood the picture. We see the compositions put together in a studio by a real artist with a great sense of balance, balance and then zoom in the middle, gust of wind on the surface and suddenly, you know, reality just slaps you across the face and he's frequently doing that. I don't know if this comparison is overdone, but I, I just want to make the point, this is sort of the taste of the time. This balance, I mean, this is France, Sebastian Bourdon, classical landscape of the 1660s, the same time, totally abstracted, but something of a similar sense of blocks and frontality and different layers of space uh, done in a French rather than a very Dutch way. Should we quit now? No? no? Geez, I've got to go home at some point. Okay, just a few more pictures. I don't have to explain this one. This is in the Met. I would call it early mature for Vermeer. He is giving up objects in the foreground. In the 1660s, you'll see this from now on, he tends to move everything to the middle ground. It is sort of an optical way of doing space. No more tactile leading building blocks through the foreground, but showing kind of a screen of light and color values at a certain distance, not too far, not too near. And in that, a window, a forearm, it's like if he took anatomy class, he just deliberately forgot it right there. This is not an arm that tells you anything about arms. If you came from Mars, you would say an arm consists of a broad band of shadow with a highlight on the edge of it, and it's got no third dimension. And it's a wonderful suggestion of how a, an arm might appear backlit at a window. By the way, the glass is totally murky, except right there at the fingers, where he wants to show us the fingers, we see nothing else, and then these wonderful effects of light. And then in the head, which by the way is awfully abstract, the lines of the nodes lead right up into the eyebrows like some classical sculpture. She's really quite egg-like. But then the drapery, this kind of morning toilet uh, uh, scarf that women and upscale houses would wear in the morning when they'd wash their face and do their makeup. You know, you don't strip down and jump in the shower back in these days. Basically, you just do your face. And she is protecting her good day clothes with this scarf over her shoulders and her head. And we'll probably take them off later. A lot of maids did not. But it's a wonderful opportunity for creating these transparencies like the line of the back of her head through the linen here, and the actual yellow and blue of the costume down there. And of course, in the, well, I'm just showing you quickly a church interior with similar 
effects of light and space. De Vita also tends to compress everything into the middle ground for this optical way of describing space. Do you get this point here? Composition, two pictures of around the same time, similar poses. Does style matter in Dutch art? Well, how about we paint Aristotle in the style of Vermeer? Does that make sense? What the hell is Aristotle doing in the kitchen? Anyway, or paint this lovely young lady in the style of Rembrandt's Aristotle a few years before. What is so biblical and profound and dead serious and cosmic and thoughtful about a young woman with a water pitcher in a light-filled interior? I mean, it's maybe a rather adolescent way to put it, but if you actually think of these subjects in the other guy's style, then it becomes clear how wonderful Vermeer's style works for his subject, which is the ideal woman in an ideal home after a war period and a time of peace. And these wonderful counterpoises of rectangles, three of them basically in a cone in the middle and the sense of balance in this figure, which for Aristotle by Rembrandt suggests thought between material and spiritual values here also suggest balance or temperance. And e even in the colors, the primaries, the yellow, the blue, the red, in the picture itself, if this were by Mondrian, it would be one of the most harmonious of his pictures. And that works well for the um, beatific uh, way he was looking at this woman. Then you get into the details, and it's just amazing. Again, red, yellow, blue, the primaries, red lid of the jewel box, antique jewel box from Spain with pearls spilling out of it right next to a silver gilt basin and pitcher, solid silver with gold plate. This is not your brass thing from the 19th century. So these are really luxury objects. Here is that clockwork again. We go from these incredible reflections up to this picture spout. It splits that way, and then the spout goes right into her arm there. And similarly, if the handle picks up, isn't going to quite touch that lion over there, and comes up, and this extraordinary blur of the foreshortened arm and the seemingly moving spout at the same time. So there are these like picture puzzle pieces putting together the composition within which are these extraordinary optical phenomena. In the future, Vermeer will lean in the optical direction. He's going to give up that obvious kind of composition. Lawrence Gowing, who was a painter and wrote a great book on Vermeer back in 1952, he called this composition the most primitive of its type in Vermeer's work. What kind of word is that for Vermeer? But he meant it. He meant this was the first of them. And in Vermeer's later designs, you see that they don't work quite so obviously in terms of balance and composition as this picture does. This, by the way, is the contour of this dress. And I'm sorry, those of you who would prefer a more technical lecture, but I'm not really a painter. But right here, lapis lazuli with three other minerals in it, the skirt, basically two layers of blue on top of a brown ground, which he's laid in for the figure, a different ground color than the colored wall. This shadow here with, by the way, a chair that used to be in the foreground. There's a lion's head finial right there, and then he painted it out. And he paints the blue, he's already painted the white, but then he gives an extra coat in this area, and he drags that creamy color right over the blue edge right there so that it blurs. He knows that when he looks at a person in reality, he doesn't see a line like a wire at the edge. And he does that constantly in his contours, in his mature pictures. That kind of thing could come from looking at the screen of a camera obscura. Values of, to put it simply, color values when they're really intense or surprising contrasts, values of tone like a sudden drop 
from deep shadow to bright light, uh, and maybe qualities of focus. Those three things, color, tone, and focus, are all optical. And he may have seen those in a lens. As soon as he sees it, this guy, it's his own bag of tricks immediately. And it hardly matters if he saw it in another painter's work, in reality, or in a camera, he gets it and he'll use it. And the next time he does it, he didn't need Vermeer's to paint Vermeer's. He could just do it right out of his head. And you see him doing it again and again. Uh, the lute player in the Met, now we're moving in a direction where these primary colors disappear. Things become more shadowy, usually in the foreground, toning it down. Samuel van Hoogstraten wrote right around this time, this camera thing, he says, it's a great thing for young painters when they're training. They'll see what a really naturalistic picture looks like. But if you're a grown-up painter, you don't need it anymore. He actually says that in his book of 1678. A young lady looking expectantly out a window for a man, rather damaged picture. And uh, I'll just jump ahead, but these are works of the mid-1660s, shadow, light, focus, blurring forms, much more, though, than before. And then surprisingly, right in the middle of this, he drops this picture in Buckingham Palace, a sudden fashion in Delft, it seems, for these deep spaces. Vermeer ju does just two of them, inspired by this kind of Van Hoogstraten and other pictures. This is about 1664 or 5, and this is a Hoogstraten of 1662. Again, the voyeurism, the lady from the back admired by the gentleman. The mirror shows her, her the other side of her, and suddenly in the mirror we're close. We're back here, we're distant, we're 15 feet away, then we focus on the mirror, so like a zoom lens, and we're suddenly there. It's, I think, very effective for that voyeuristic <coughs> business. It is constructed on a perspective scheme with a dot on the lady's elbow, a pinprick in the <coughs> surface of the paint. He is a suitor, and he would have played the viola in that chair. He got up. He now listens to her. He's looking at her in profile, like Vermeer looked at earlier girls. He's haunted by her. He is restrained by his gentility. She's looking like the girl in the window, a bit towards him, even though the head is more frontal. Again, these sort of relationships of shape, which we don't have time to get into right now. This little bit of a picture back here corresponds to something like this painting by Baburin, which is called Roman Charity, and Vermeer's mother-in-law actually owned a painting of this composition. It's this desperate Roman general thrown in jail to starve, and his daughter visits him and keeps him alive in this way. What a strangely erotic, evocative picture. And he puts that back in a different artist, slightly different conception. What you see there is a nude back of a man with his two arms bound behind him, suggesting that this man is psychologically bound by that woman. You need to know a lot about pictures to pick up on that detail in Vermeer's day. It's like the one leg of Cupid with the mask but then there's 20 Vermeers in this household, and the patron does know the artist, and that's such a different thing for many of Vermeer's pictures than the average Dutch painting that just went out onto the open market. It's around this time Vermeer does the um, lost painting in the Gardner Museum. It could be under your bed at home. It was stolen in 1991. It may have been a pendant to this picture. It was done around the same size, the same time. It is the same size. Similar elements, these tables line up, the floor tiles are similar. There is this phenomenon in Vermeer that I like to call optional pendants. They may have been pendants, but because his patron has the right of first refusal, and so does anyone who walks into Vermeer's studio, 
he might have painted pictures as a pair, which also work well independently. That's possible in this case. The concert is really about genteel people behaving well uh, in high society, and there's a contrasting picture of mercenary love on the wall in the background, and also a contrast of two kinds of landscape, Arcadian and peaceful versus shadowy and wooded and slightly dangerous. I don't know why I have this picture here. <laughs> so, oh, we've come to the end of those slides. Any questions? <laughs> this, uh, I'll, I think we should end here. I mean, there's a few later Vermeers I could talk about. But this painting, you remember the woman with the water pitcher and its rectangles and its cone and so on. But here, it's not the primary colors. It's shadowy. You can see how this whole business here of her skirt, the table, that chair, this chair works as a kind of base for her. And then she is coincidentally against this map, which used to be multicolored in an earlier Vermeer, but it's now kind of monochrome. The most shadowy part of it sets off her luminous profile. The lightest part of the map catches the beautiful line of her neck and back behind it. And all of these design elements, you can point them out, and you can see them once they're pointed out. But they've now become so naturalistic and simplified, and you might say subservient, just the bare skeleton of design on which Vermeer has hung observation. And in this case, he's looking at light and shadow and air and a light-filled room in a very direct and straightforward way, trying to get the look of that sunlit room right in a direct way. And I think of him as looking at the subject matter also in that way. The young lady crashed, there's, there goes my wife, reading a love note, which some people say has just come into the room and it's interrupted her jewelry box here and a string of pearls. And I think it's clear what happens. There's, there's no sign that anyone's just come into the room. She's opened her jewelry box. There is a string of pearls on the table. And she finds in it, either because she was looking for it or because she keeps her treasured love letters in her treasure chest, the jewelry box. And she picks it up. She didn't just get this letter. She's reading it again. She's read it 20 times before. And what Vermeer cares about is the way her eyes lower and her mouth droops naturally and this unconscious smile on her face. And he just loves women. He loves light. And it is this wonderful harmony between form and content, or style and meaning, that he achieves in his work that makes him such a great artist. Thank you very much.